Today I want to give you a little background on how viruses work, especially in relationship to what's happening currently in 2009. One of the first things we need to truly understand about a virus in this particular case is that it is a parasite. So what I've diagrammed here is kind of a cycle of a parasite to give you an idea of what's important. Essentially a parasite cannot live on its own, so it's got to have a host. Uh, once in that host, it will then replicate itself and make more copies of itself, but ultimately what's important is its ability to then get out and spread to other species, and that's called lysis. So this idea that the parasite needs to get in the host, and in the case of influenza, that's actually in the cells of the respiratory system, it needs to do what we call infection. Once it's within the host cells, it will then use the host materials or cellular machinery to make more copies of itself. Once that is performed, then it will break open the cells, spread throughout the respiratory fluid, uh, and then spread to other organisms or species by something as simple as coughing. So that's the initial idea of what a virus is and what's important to kind of understand how this influenza is going to work. Another important concept uh, to help you understand how these viruses work is the idea of the central dogma of biology. Essentially the central dogma is the idea that DNA or what we call a nucleic acid or deoxyribonucleic acid is used as a template for the production of an intermediate that we call RNA or ribonucleic acid and ultimately that is then utilized to as a template to create proteins. What's interesting about proteins is they tend to be or are three-dimensional in shape and their shape will help determine their function. Uh, we will see how this comes into play when we talk about the different proteins that are involved in influenza A. So essentially what's important about the central dogma is the idea that basically changes in the RNA can ultimately lead to changes in the protein. And those changes in the protein have the ability to change the shape of the protein, thereby possibly changing the actual function of the protein. Okay, so the particular type of influenza you're currently hearing about in the news is influenza A. The reality in nature, there tends to be two types or three types of influenza, influenza A, B, and C. All three types of these are found in humans. Influenza A is primarily found in the avian population, but has the ability to go to a few other different species, humans being one of them. What's kind of unique about influenza A is it seems to be in humans, uh, it has the ability to attack the respiratory system. So we call it a respiratory virus. And also, it's an RNA-based virus. So if you go back to the central dogma that we had talked about, we're going to bypass the DNA step and we're going to move into RNA. And what's interesting about this and why it seems to be such a variable and kind of what we call a mutant type of virus is that when the virus actually gets into the cell, it needs to replicate itself. So it needs to make more RNA. The process of doing that in the cell, however, uh, is not proofread. So a lot of errors can be introduced into the RNA when it is replicating itself. Uh, that typically doesn't happen very much in DNA because there's proofreading enzymes that will take care of that. But in the RNA, it seems to lack the proofreading ability. So a lot of mutations or changes in the R RNA can occur. So if you crawl back over here, changes in that RNA could ultimately lead to changes into the shape and ultimately the function of that protein. That's going to definitely be important when we look at the ability of the influenza A virus to mutate. So one of the important things to understand about the influenza A is its nomenclature or its system of naming. And primarily we look at what's found on the surface of the virus, or what we call antigenic uh, proteins. These are the viruses actually that are, these are the sections of the virus that are found on the surface, therefore they are what's susceptible to our immune system. Uh, so we like to refer to them. The particular type that we're seeing today in the news is an H1N1 variety. There are two antigenic proteins. They are the H and N. H stands for hemagglutinin, which is a protein that's associated with the ability of the virus to infect the host. And there are 16 subtypes that we find in nature. The particular subtype we're, subtype we're interested in is subtype 1. And the other protein, the N protein, is neuraminidase. This has a nine subtypes found in nature, and the one we're interested in is one. And this particular protein is associated with the actual ability of the virus 
to break open the cell to release more viral particles. So once again, kind of review, uh, these are proteins, the H and the N proteins are proteins found in the surface of the virus. So here's the virus and here's the surface and here are the two proteins, one kind of shown rounded with blue and the other one in orange and square. And the H protein is important for infection, so based on how well this protein works at recognizing a host will determine how well it can infect that host. Likewise, the N protein, this protein is important for the lysis or the breaking open of the cell. So based on how well this protein works can determine then ultimately how well this virus can be spread. So how a simple cough may release thousands and millions of viral particles. Now I want to talk about the importance of the shape of the protein and how well or how viral this protein is or what we call uh, virulence. So here we got our H protein again. And what I want to show here is on the host side. So in order for the virus to infect, it needs to bind to what we call receptors on the host membrane. When the virus is able to bind the receptor, the host cell will bring the virus into it and then the virus can take advantage of the cellular machinery. So if we go back to that central dogma, it can then utilize the ribosomes and what's found in the nucleus to actually make more viral particles. But here's where the shape is important. If you notice, I've got two receptors found on the surface just for demonstration's sake. And as you can see, this one, in terms of like a lock and key mechanism, matches up very well with this particular host protein or receptor. Whereas this one, it doesn't match. So what happens is this one is able to bind here, but if this were the membrane receptor that was found on the host, the H protein would not be able to bind. So this is at some level where we can get what we call species specificity. So perhaps this one is found in the swine and this one would be found in the human. So with this version of the H1 protein, you can see that it would be able to infect the swine. However, it would be unable to infect the human version of it. Now we're going to show a little different occasion here. Now what's happened is this virus sat in the pigs for a period of time and in doing so, you know, we said we could have changes in the RNA and ultimately those changes can lead to changes in the shape of the protein. So here we've got our original starting one and as we can see we can bind to this one but we are unable to bind to this one. But now as it's been in the pig or in humans based on, you know, what the scenario is, we saw that we have a small change in its shape. It's still rounded in nature here, but now it's got a little kink. So theoretically here, for simplicity's sake, we are now able to bind to both receptors. So by being in the pig and replicating and, and causing changes in the RNA, we have mutated it or changed the shape of the protein such now that it can bind to both type of receptors. So what this means in the general idea is we have now created the ability to move from the pig because this was what was previously found in pig and now infect the host. So a simple change in the RNA through multiple generations of the virus now ultimately leads to a change in the protein and can change now the specificity of the host. So it can now infect a host where it did not normally infect the host. Another thing I wanted to talk about is kind of where the name swine flu originally came from. So if we take the virus particles, remember which are RNA based, and we isolated the viruses and sequenced it. So we figured out what the A, U, G's and C's, or in terms of DNA, A, T, G's and C's were, and we compared those to a database, we found that certain sections of the RNA uh, pulled down sequences that were related to avian, or bird-like, and also sequences that were related to swine, and also sequences that were related to human. So a lot of the sequences seem to be related to virus sequences that we have found previously in swine. And so that's initially why uh, the name swine flu was given. Not that it came from swine to humans, but the fact of how it was similar to previous viruses isolated uh, in terms of the RNA sequence.